I think it is. Sibilance, sibilance, check one, check two. All right, thanks.
All right, everybody, good afternoon. We're shutting the doors down. This is a limited engagement. If you're not in the room, you do not get the prize. Lock it down. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Ed Chamberlain, uh, honored to really uh, MC or moderate or facilitate Choose your word here for the session, uh, reviewing the uh, opportunities with the Department of State. Uh, a couple ground rules first. You know the drill. If you've been a couple of these, I'd ask you to sit as far forward. None of this escaping business. Halfway through, we know the drill. The other is that uh, please uh, you know, be mindful, uh, silence all your gadgets and things so we can keep the, the conversation here focused uh, on this day. Fire exits, follow the green signs. They're self-explanatory. What else do they, you know, you know, I don't say the right things. Yeah, do that, do that, that's good. I don't say the right things, bell for bra, or never let me do this again. I want to thank uh, all of the firms uh, that have served as sponsors uh, for this event. Um, again, this, this, this event this is the eighth time I've been in small business. I think it's the sixth for Viv and uh, then the first for Stephanie. We'll get to that. Um, but this, none of this would be possible without our sponsors. So really appreciate for all that. And I think that's all the house rules. At the end, I really want some hard questions for Viv. We want to stomp Viv. That is the drill here. So think about your questions. But when you do it, don't sit there and yell stuff from your chair. You know, ask for a mic. Stand up. Introduce yourself and your firm and then ask your question. Just, just big courtesy. There's a big game of yelling questions from the chairs. And I think that's it. So with that, I would like to do the brief uh, intros uh, to our, our honored speakers today. In all sincerity, I really want to thank both of you for being here today. It is way too easy on the government side, I've been told, uh, to say no uh, when industry asks and the society asks for you to speak. So we really appreciate it. So first, we'll start with Stephanie Felton, who is a professional engineer registered uh, in the state of Virginia. She serves as the Division Chief for Project Development Coordination uh, for the Near East and South Central Asia has been with OBO here now for more than 15 years. Uh, she has led project management in the Middle East, North Africa, and South Central Asia, all the easy spots. So you just got over, understand. Uh, but uh, leading project management work uh, for our consulates and our embassies, and really making sure that we are able to advance our national interests with our, the safety of our facilities in mind, which I'm sure is going to be in the presentation today. Uh, she has a portfolio of over uh, 500 million in design and construction annually, uh, which is uh, one of the reasons we're all interested in to hear about those opportunities. Uh, formerly a tenured member of the U.S. Foreign Service, an acting office director for uh, design and engineering, a special assistant to the Undersecretary of Management, and a project manager in the African Affairs region. So again, all the easy jobs, well, even as a construction manager and in the DR, no less. So really appreciate. Um, your, your, your service uh, to the Department of State and, and involvement today. And last, and certainly not least, a uh, civil engineer from Texas A&M, go Aggies. See, there's the groan, there's the groan, there's the groan. All right, so Stephanie, thanks for being here today. Uh, Stephanie will be our first speaker as we go into the, uh, the, the slide deck here. Uh, we have David Vivian, but I've been told if you call him that or refer to him that you clearly don't know him because uh, he prefers to be called Viv, and is on his, uh, is on his uh, actually name card there. Yeah, there you go. Uh, Viv is a warranted contracting officer and the branch chief for the architectural and engineering contract branch within the Office of Acquisition Management. Man, that's a mouthful. For facilities and design construction vision. I didn't even finish. So we like to say he is the lord of all acquisition in OBO and supporting OBO. I made that up. That's not official. Uh, he's responsible for the acquisition of architectural engineering construction service valued at $3.9 billion in fiscal year 2017, and I assume in 2018, 2019, pretty similar. Yeah, we're going to go with that. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll skip that. Um, but most importantly, as uh, we are the Society of American Military Engineers, Dave joined the Department of State in August 2000 after retiring from the U.S. Air Force. So he's a veteran, 26-year career in the United States Air Force, uh, focused initially as a debt engine mechanic, and then 22 years as acquisition professional. So really appreciate your service, Viv, and being here today. And uh, go Army. And for the last... Uh, for the, for the last 18 years, Dave has provided acquisition support for uh, OBO, facilitate and uh, acquire contract support, contractor involvement, design, construction, maintenance, renovation of Department of State facilities worldwide, 
40 year acquisition career has included an extensive range of all forms of acquisition and he is extremely knowledgeable and really appreciate you sharing your knowledge today. He's a graduate in business from McKendry University in Lebanon, Illinois. But that's, it doesn't stop there. We have more folks from OBO because you're all going to want to ask these hard questions to our speakers here today. But you got to ask some hard questions to Anthony Josie. He's here in the front row from representing small business. Is accompanied by Renee Hill. Right here, very good. We got Jennifer Leong, one of the contracting officers. So hard questions there. Chrissy Fields, where you at? There you go, contract, and Lori Boykin. So we have a full team, and Patrick, where'd Patrick go? He, we lost Patrick, all right, very good. Okay, we, we got too many people now, man, yeah, it's good. But the whole point is today is uh, please let's make this a lively session. Uh, we're going to go through really the mission of OPO, the opportunities, and really looking forward to your questions at the end. Because if you don't ask them, I'm going to ask some really dumb questions. And it's guaranteed. So with that, Stephanie, uh, please uh, start us off. Yeah, yeah, give it up. Yeah. All right. I'd like to thank Ed for warming the crowd up for me. Uh, yeah, yeah. No, I'm I'm really happy to be back in Texas. I uh, spent some of my formative years here in the North Texas area, and I was really pleased. This is the first conference I've been to that had not only Dr. Pepper but Diet Dr. Pepper. You normally don't get that kind of selection, so um, really glad to be here. All right, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about overseas buildings, or as we call it, OBO. And uh, this is our mission and our vision. Basically, we provide safe, secure facilities for our diplomats to live and work overseas. Uh, we provide a platform for diplomacy for them to conduct the important work of overseeing foreign policy to host governments. And our vision is to provide a built environment that showcases the best in American technology, design, and ingenuity. And also, we act as a good steward of the built environment and the resources of the host country that we have this bilateral relationship with. And I'm going to take a minute to just tell you also a little bit more about OBO. We're a bureau within the State Department that oversees the design, construction, and maintenance and acquisition of all of our diplomatic facilities overseas. Uh, if any of you have worked with GSA, we are kind of like GSA before uh, the overseas environment. Um, Everything overseas, aside from DOD facilities, government office buildings that we have overseas, uh, that is OBO that oversees all of that. So um, we're about 1,200 people, architects, engineers, real estate professionals, art curators, uh, you name it, we have it in our building. And we have the unique mission of being not only the owner and the owner's representatives on our construction sites, but we are also the code official and the authority having jurisdiction. So we also set the requirements and the building code standards that all of our projects must meet overseas. So it's a really unique, uh, a unique niche within the federal government, and it's something that I found is a unique way to use my background as a civil engineer to serve my country, and that was really a big reason why I left the private sector. Is this opportunity came along, and it had so much more meaning to me than just you know turning a profit for the land development clients that I was working for back then. So, and it's something that it really is meaningful to uh, everyone within OBO. Uh, it's really it's it's a unique mission, and it really does um, we enjoy being public servants. So. Uh, we have a really big portfolio, 291 locations, or we refer to them as posts, um, over 80 million square feet, over $80 billion worth of portfolio. Uh, that's, you know, more than 1,000 office buildings, residences. Uh, our people serving overseas have to live somewhere, and uh, we do rent a lot of houses and apartments for them to live in. We also have uh, ambassadors' residences and Marine Security Guard residences. So that's a large number of leases that we, that our real estate professionals administer, uh, and a lot of properties that we acquire in order to build new embassies and new consulates. Uh, and then we also have uh, you know, 25,000 other assets, which would be things that aren't the office buildings or residences, and more than 18,000 culturally significant objects and artwork. Uh, we have, uh, I mentioned art curators earlier, we have a significant focus on um, 
representing our relationship with the host country through artwork. And it's also, it's, it's a nice way to represent American culture and that cultural exchange that comes with uh, having a curated, uh, curated artwork within our facilities. We have a Kehinde Wiley painting. Um, you might remember Kehinde Wiley as the artist who did uh, President Obama's portrait um, in recent years. We have one of those in our embassy in Santo Domingo. We have a uh, Ellsworth Kelly mural in Berlin and so many other cultural artifacts and treasures that uh, we have the unique uh, opportunity to maintain and curate. So this is the kinds of buildings that we build and operate and maintain um, and design. Uh, I mentioned already housing, offices, annexes. Uh, we also have warehouses and shops uh, because if you have all these residences, you have furniture for them and you've got to store somewhere. You've got to store your copy paper somewhere. So we, uh, we do have some warehouses and shops as well. And, uh, and then cultural heritage properties. Uh, this includes uh, some very unique properties we have in uh, like the original American legation in Tangier, Algeria. Um, we have a culturally significant property in Paris, which is the Talleyrand Hotel um, that dates back to the Marshall Plan. So um, a lot of unique properties uh, that we have the privilege to maintain. And then this slide represents the, uh, the breadth of what we do. Um, it's, we're all over the world, so it spans a lot of different climates. Um, we have people in Kazakhstan right now that are at that negative 40 degree uh, point. Uh, we have people in Saudi Arabia that are, aren't quite 140 degrees today, but it's pretty hot there. Um, desert, tropical, um, we have some very small posts and we have some very large ones. And I'm going to talk a little bit about standard embassy design later. but. Uh, we have a really hard time standardizing an embassy because it's not one size fits all. We have a lot of different tenants, not all tenants. Uh, government agencies are at every embassy. As you might imagine, we have a bigger DOD presence at some of our embassies and we have a bigger DEA or FBI presence at others. Uh, it just really depends on the, our foreign policy objectives and the, the climate of that country and what we're trying to do uh, in our relationship with them. Um, we have some very small properties that are, you know, three acres, and then we have some like uh, Baghdad. We have more than 100 acres in Baghdad, both at the airport and uh, on the embassy compound. Um, we have different security situations around the world. London, uh, one of the design goals for that was to present a very open and welcoming campus. Uh, we tried to hide some of the physical security uh, objectives there, you know, the anti-RAM is kind of hidden in a wall, and we have what some people call a moat, it's a stormwater, uh, stormwater management pond, but, you know, people can't really cross that too easily. You know, those are sort of more welcoming ways to uh, have a security posture, but then, you know, we have Beirut and Saudi Arabia where we have literal guard towers, and that's just necessary because of the security environment there and the risks that we see, and so it's, again, it's not one size fits all. There's a lot of different things that you might be asked to design or construct for, um, for our posts. Um, we talked a few minutes ago about our budget. The, this is Dave's, <laughs> he, or Viv's rather. He uh, oversees our $3.8 billion um, of construction awards annually. Um, we do anticipate to get about that same amount in FY20. Uh, we typically ask for uh, you know, a budget of this realm, and sometimes we get told no, but usually Congress gives us the entire amount. So we don't really see this number going down anytime soon. And then these are the types of projects that we have. Um, our bread and butter for most of the last 20 years has been capital security construction. Um, that was driven by the uh, East Africa bombings and uh, people sort of associated with the standard embassy design. But capital security is what's driving the replacement of our aging and substandard embassy stock with new modern facilities that meet all the current security requirements. And so that's about $20, million, $20 billion active construction right now, um, but that's the brunt of our annual, um, our annual budget. Uh, but then we also are now trying to turn the tide a little more to major renovations. We're gonna see more of the, the tipping from 
new construction to major renovation in coming years because our building stock that we built you know 15 or 20 years ago is starting to age and is going to need to be recapitalized um, but then we also have a lot of facilities where it does make sense to move the embassy to a new property uh, we really do need to renovate in place and bring it up to the security standard that we can with um with a property that we already have so um an example of that is paris we're not we have a really primo piece of property right there on the champs d'elysees right next to the place de la concorde we're not moving out of that anytime soon but we so we have to renovate in place and so that's kind of a constant is renovation in paris um but so we do have about close to a billion dollars worth of workload uh in major renovations coming up um in in coming years and then uh, compound security upgrades and also minor construction and improvement. That's where I think a lot of our small business partners come into play. Um, we do have small business set-asides and contracting objectives that Dave can talk, Vic can talk a little bit more about. Um, but those are smaller projects somewhere in the, you know, between one and $10 million range. Um, those are the ongoing improvements that we have to existing embassy and consulate compounds, and that's um, we have a significant chunk of workload going on there. Uh, we also, I mentioned, you need land to build new embassies, and that's where our acquisitions and disposals budget uh, comes in. We buy new sites, we dispose of old sites uh, every year, and then um, mentioned earlier, the 16,000 leases. That is, uh, you know, the housing that we lease for um, for our diplomats to live in. So Embassy After Next um, is part of our strategic goals that our new director has set for us. He's uh, Director Davis has been with us for about a year and a half. He came to us uh, from some previous DOD, uh, DOD work, and he has really put a focus on resiliency. I think I've heard that word a lot at SAME events. Uh, resilience is important to the DOD. It's certainly important to us state as well. And so uh, our three-pronged approach to the embassy after next is security, resiliency, and stewardship. And security, of course, we need to build safe, secure facilities that will be a safe place for our people to work. Um, resiliency, we need to make sure that whatever is thrown at us, be it um, a terrorist threat or a climate threat, that our facility is resilient and can keep operating and can keep functioning even in the face of that adversity. And then stewardship, that's being a good, um, a good steward not only of the environment and the host country's resources, but also being a good steward of taxpayer money. I mean, and we're, everyone in this room uh, is probably a taxpayer. Um, and so that's just something that's important to, to us at OBO, but it's important to all of us. Uh, security, uh, these are some fairly um, graphic images of the, uh, what drove our security um, requirements, uh, the bombings in Beirut in the mid-80s, and the 1998 bombings uh, in East Africa. That is where we got the standard embassy design and the uh, a few public laws that changed the way that we build. Uh, SECA and OSPB um, are two things that control the requirements for how we have to build all of our new properties or get waivers um, from diplomatic security uh, if we can't. But waivers are few and far between because it's just too important and we really can't have, uh, we can't have that same loss of life again. Uh, so it's, it's not only public law, but it's something that resonates very, um, very much with us uh, at OBO. Uh, I know that in uh, 2012, uh, everybody heard about Benghazi and what happened there and loss of life. But the thing that um, actually I found kind of heartening about that day was that there were a number of other embassies that were attacked on that same day, and you didn't hear about them because they withstood the attack. So that was, um, it was, it was a very emotional day for all of us, but it was also, we saw that why, what we do is so important. And then resiliency, I mentioned that. Uh, these are a couple images. Uh, the top is uh, post-earthquake in Haiti, and the bottom is a flood in Bangkok. And through both of these, um, these are both uh, environmental or you know natural uh, natural disaster uh, events that we have to worry about when we're building. Um, the positive for Haiti was that we had just completed a new embassy compound in Port-au-Prince maybe two or three years prior to this earthquake, and it withstood the earthquake with only minor cracking. It was superficial, um, whereas 
most of the buildings in the Capitol were just decimated. Um, the host government buildings were decimated. And so our embassy in Haiti was a platform for the recovery efforts because we had uh, we had clean water, we had a wastewater treatment plant, we had generators, and so we were a self-contained little little mini city uh, that was uh, really a platform for that recovery effort. And that was, again, um, a positive for us to see why what we do matters. Uh, and then, you know, in Bangkok, we're building a new office annex there, and this is just an example of what we have to worry about. We have to uh, build a facility that will be resistant to flooding so that people can uh, still get to work and still um, come use use our facilities um, because the city doesn't shut down when the water is uh, hip deep. You see people commuting to work and going about their daily business. And so uh, we need to be open for business too. And then stewardship. Uh, we have, I mentioned the culturally significant properties that we have around the world, and here's some pictures, some examples of some of them. Um, really, the top row is an example of uh, some of the very uh, significant architectural facilities that we have. Uh, the New Delhi Chancery, which you see on the left-hand side of the screen, was designed by uh, Edward Brellstone. And a fun fact about this, uh, if any of you have been to the Kennedy Center, you might notice that it looks a lot like uh, the Chancery in New Delhi. Actually, the Kennedy Center, the reason it looks like this chancery was uh, when John F. Kennedy and Jackie Kennedy visited New Delhi um, on one of their uh, trips, international trips, she was so impressed by the architecture that when she commissioned the uh, Kennedy Center construction or, or you know, had a part in the, case, the selection of the architecture for the Kennedy Center, uh, she wanted it to look like the chancery in New Delhi. And so Edward Durrellstone was the architect for the Kennedy Center. Uh, the London Embassy that was designed by Euro Saarinen. Uh, we've actually just we've sold this property um, and we built a new one that's designed by Kieran Timberlake. But this was um, one of the pieces of architectural history uh, that we have within uh, our portfolio. And then the Athens Chancery was designed by Walter Gropius, and it's currently under renovation right now by Anne Beha. Um, well, she was the architect for the renovation. It is under construction right now, and it is an example of the we had to maintain the historic and significant facade, so she worked around the, the physical upgrades that needed to be done, and they, they worked out a way to take the stone cladding off, do the, uh, the structural upgrade, and put the stone cladding back and maintain the, um, the appearance of the chancery. And so that's something, um, another piece of the complicated puzzle that is our project, is there's always something, there's always something different with every uh, project, be it you know a historic building or a culturally significant building, or you know we have a crusader's tomb on our land in Jerusalem, uh, we had a, a, a burial, an ancient burial ground on a t on a site in Sopia, Macedonia. Um, uh, hopefully, it's not haunted now. Um, we did have to uh, relocate that cemetery, but um, all the uh, horror movies have told me that now it will be haunted, so um, just be careful if you're going to Skopje. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there, there's always something, uh, you know, historic boulder than Dharan, uh, or not Dharan, sorry, uh, Hyderabad. Uh, we have, you know, tree preservation, you have that on a lot of projects, but there's always something different, and so that's what makes this work so challenging, but it also makes it really rewarding. And uh, here's some examples on the top of uh, the Standard Embassy Design Era, Panama City and Johannesburg, um, and some of our other recent projects. Uh, this is probably a good time to talk to you about Standard Embassy Design. Some of you may have been familiar with it. Um, that was what we did um, really up through uh, about 10 years ago. Uh, we, were, we were doing Standard Embassy Design, which was um, attempted to take the, the principles of a major building program like a Walmart or a Rite Aid or a CVS might do and apply that to embassy design. And there were a lot of wins there because we did do a lot of embassies very quickly using a design and build uh, construction method and a standard embassy template. However, what it didn't account for was that unlike a Walmart where you might have a tire, you know, a tire section or a garden section or not, we might might have two consular windows, or we might have 40 consular windows, and so we might have two or three government tenants, we might have 40 government tenants. So there's a lot of variation that that really didn't account for. And so we could never be as standardized as we really wanted to be, and that was when we went into design excellence because we got some we got some public criticism that some of these embassies were not really representing architecture and the American people the way they should. Um, 
So we, we went to excellence, and some people saw that as throwing out the baby with the bathwater and swinging the pendulum all the way to the opposite end and doing everything really bespoke and, and you know, anything goes kind of, uh, you know, drive, architecture was driving it. But that really, we still had our standard details and our design guidance that, that remained in place. So that was still, um, there was still an element of standardization to it. It's just it wasn't really well represented in that way. But that brings us to what we're doing now, which we're calling Embassy After Next. And we have these five pillars uh, that we're pursuing. Um, some of them are internal, some of them are more external facing that um, our partners in the design and construction industry might see. Uh, but standardization is one of them. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a subsequent slide. Um, but we're going to focus on uh, giving better guidance on how to apply appropriate solutions where you don't need to innovate. Um, and I'll talk about that. Um, but we're also focusing on better use of our data with our project man performance management and also our life cycle asset management. Um, the federal government doesn't do a great job in uh, obligating funds for maintenance um, versus new construction, because new construction, you have a really fun ribbon cutting and the, the constituents love it. But um, the, the maintenance is really where we, we need to focus our attention. So we're going to have renewed attention on that in the future. Uh, we have already moved to digital design review. Um, we are reducing the number of paper copies um, that we receive from our designers. And we save, on average, about $100,000 per project, per design, which that doesn't sound like a lot, but as a taxpayer, I mean, $100,000 is still a lot of money to me. And I think that over the, uh, an entire building program, that it, it, it amounts to a lot of money. Um, and, and uh, you know, we're not killing as many trees. So I think everybody can get on board with that. It's also bringing us really into um, the common era um, and, and using uh, Bluebeam and other things like that, um, using what the industry is using. And then billing information management, we are, uh, we're, we're creating standards for our BIM models so that we can use them not only in design and through construction, but also in uh, the maintenance of the facility and trying, again, to, to keep up with industry or at least try to catch up with industry um, and, and um, use those best practices. So getting into standard embassy design, um, we're now calling it ESS, or Embassy Standardization System. And those of you who are transportation engineers in the room, you might see LOS 1, 2, and 3 at the bottom. That's not level of service. That's level of standardization. I have a joke for the civil engineers. I heard one person laugh. Thank you. Um, <laughs> so, so what we're looking at is the appropriateness of how standards how much standardization should be used. So where you see LOS 3, level, level standardization 3, that would be used maybe on a property where we want to have, we want to use more prototypes. You can see it kind of ratchets backwards. So where you want to um, use some prototypical buildings, uh, we're in any case where we don't need to innovate like a compound access control. There's only so many ways to, to enter the compound with our security requirements. It's not really something we need to innovate on, change the building skin, but it's going to function the same way. So we'll have building prototypes for, for some of those outbuildings, but we might have more prototypical uh, chanceries as well for certain situations where we don't feel that we need to innovate that. Um, but we'll also, in any case, we'll always have a standard contract, um, our standard design requirements that I mentioned earlier that OBO authors. Um, we will have uh, SRPMs, or space requirement plan modules, and those are, uh, those tell you what it is that, what kind of space you need to design and construct. Um, but then we'll also include design adjacencies, um, what function needs to be adjacent to what else, how do people flow through the building, um, what needs to be separate. Those will be used in any case, but then you might also add an extra layer of type diagrams, like here's the type of chancery that would function best on this site, please use this. So it's, it's allowing a menu of things for our designers to design, but it also it's, it's a way of conveying our design guidance in a clearer way to you, our industry partners. And we think that it, in the end, it will be clearer and it will be more useful to you and it will be clearer to us and it will make for a better relationship there. So our project delivery methods, uh, we uh, are really good at design build. That's what we've been doing a lot, especially design build with bridging. Um, but we do also use design bid build in some cases. And um, we are going to be doing a straight design build project, which I think Viv is going to talk about um, towards the end. 
Um, and we have dabbled in construction manager as constructor. Um, we are trying more uh, formal partnering. Um, we're doing a couple partnering uh, pilots in Kampala and Moscow right now. Um, but we're also looking at instituting elements and best practices of partnering on all of our construction projects. So um, we, we've taken the uh, input we've gotten from the industry that uh, sometimes we can be a little um, difficult to work with. Um, but we, just, we have a lot of requirements. Um, but we're self-aware about that. And so um, we, we just make our, our choice as to which procurement method best suits both the, the need, the design, and the, um, the urgency of the product, and we, we make that selection. But design build is a bit of our bread and butter. Uh, so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Viv to talk about the dry contracting stuff. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. Oh, no, definitely not. <laughs> Uh, well, now that you've finished looking at all those boring pictures of uh, buildings, we'll get down to the real nitty-gritty, which is the acquisition side of the house, of course. Um, and the acquisition management office in the State Department handles all acquisitions that the Department of State requires. Uh, my particular section, the Facilities de Design and Construction uh, uh, Division, handles uh, uh, support for OBO, Overseas Buildings Operations. Uh, within the Acquisition Management Office is, are other divisions. There's about 280 people. Our particular division is comprised of maybe 40, 45 people supporting OBO. But as you can see with the other number of people, 280, then there's a lot of other acquisitions that are going on at the Department of State. So if you're not uh, particularly suited for support for OBO, there may be other sections in the department that you can support on the uh, acquisition side. Certainly, uh, there's uh, DS, uh, Diplomatic Security. They have a big uh, um, contracting office supporting them, contracting division. Uh, there's a uh, counselor section. Uh, they, they require a, uh, a standalone contracting support for their unit. Um, international um, Drug Interdiction, they have a, a particular uh, hefty uh, contracting support branch, uh, division as well. Um, but my, my unit, uh, we're comprised of uh, three different branches. I run the AE branch, uh, which handles all acquisition of architectural engineering services as well as a good share of the construction requirements. Uh, Jim Thomas, who's sitting in the audience, he is the branch chief for the construction branch. And of course, they uh, handle a good share of the construction requirements as well. And then uh, the major support branch, which Patrick uh, works in, Patrick is in the audience as well, they handle mostly things that are not construction related in, uh, uh, for OBO. But they do also want to handle some construction because you get to travel on construction projects, but you don't travel on uh, other acquisitions in support of OBO. Um, and of course, you, the, while we're looking at all the pro, uh, uh, pictures for the uh, buildings, uh, my st stack of paper there, that's the guy contracts, and the contracts, of course, translate to those buildings. So without the contracts, you wouldn't be able to look at those pretty buildings. That's, that's my, my, my pitch. <laughs> but anyway, um, for AE source selections, of course, we use the Brooks Act as required by law and regulation. Um, the, uh, we're, we're really looking for companies that have uh, the capability and the, um, the experience to build buildings. You don't have to have uh, prior OBO work. We're looking for just the capabilities and we think that you can transfer those capabilities to overseas uh, construction to support OBO, design rather, to construct OBO, to support OBO. Uh, selection criteria, uh, of course, we're looking for highly qualified companies and uh, with the proper capabilities. The initial um, source selection phase for the selection of AE uh, um, companies, design firms, focuses on the lead designer. And then the other phase, the next phase, focuses on the capabilities of the team that the AE um, design firm is bringing to the table. And of course, um, like I said, we're working on the Brooks Act, and we pick always the highest qualified companies uh, that are uh, sub submitting proposals and in the evaluation stage. Uh, selection of construction companies. Uh, we have basically two methods for construction company selection. 
we use the best value trade-off type um, source selection, and we use the uh, low price technically acceptable. Neither one of those are uh, a default. Uh, it just depends on the project and the uh, size of the project, the complexity of the project, and just the best source selection process that we think will result in the best value to the government. Because, of course, the low price technically acceptable uh, uh, source selection al always results in the best value source selection for the government as well. And again, we're looking for the highest qualified companies to actually perform the construction. Uh, large business, small business, we have plenty of small business set-asides uh, that are um, available. On the, um, on the side of the design, uh, I, we, we, we award maybe about 120 IDIQ contracts that we have on our books. Uh, we have just awarded, I think, it's 16 uh, IDIQ contracts for design services. And these IDIQ contracts were just awarded uh, earlier this year, so they're five-year contracts, so they won't be up for reaward for another at least three years. We th it takes us a long time to get through the acquisition stage and through the uh, proposal evaluation uh, process. So we usually start about two years before the contracts expire. So in about another two and a half years, you should see a fair bit of for reacquisition of these uh, design services IDIQ contracts. But these are the list of contractors that uh, actually won those companies, and uh, they are all very busy. We're awarding contracts to them now for uh, design services required to support OBO. And, and I'll just say a little piece there. This uh, list of firms that you see here, um, we had received some feedback um, from the industry that uh, there were, we're awarding IDIQs to the same few firms. You know, we used to have like five or six. And so this last go round, we went with 16 different firms and there are about five there that have never done any work for BO and they're small businesses. And so um, there, there are opportunities to, um, to grow into our work, um, certainly partnering with these firms, uh, but also um, to, be, to become a, the primary contract holder yourselves as a small business. So um, you don't have to have previous uh, OBO work to get OBO work. Uh, you just have to represent how your work, your past work is relevant um, to what we're doing. And we do view having um, uh, diversity in the size and location of our firms really does help represent the American people uh, to foreign countries you know, with the built environment. Uh, the next set I'd like, like, like to talk about is the uh, AE Support Services IDIQ contracts. Now these are contracts awarded to usually AE type firms that uh, will be providing other services that AE firms provide other than design services. There's a small contingent of uh, design services required by these contracts, but most of this is for studies and uh, planning surveys and other uh, type of services that AEs provide other than design services. These contracts are expiring later this year, so probably sometime before uh, Christmas or just after Christmas, you'll see a FedBiz Ops announcement issued for the reacquisition of this set of contracts. Uh, it, that's, of course, if we can get uh, the, uh, the, what, the announcement system back up and running, because, of course, it's transferring from FedBiz Ops over to st uh, SAM.gov, and we haven't been able to get our uh, passwords and uh, registration down yet. But as soon as we do, you'll see some more acquisitions coming from uh, uh, AQM. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> this slide, sorry. I was speaking to the wrong slide. This slide is for top secret um, uh, design services IDIQ contracts. Uh, within OBO, there's a special group of people that handle uh, acquisition services for uh, China, Moscow, and some other special uh, locations that require top secret clearances. And these IDIQ contracts were awarded by that group of acquisition professionals about, oh, two years ago. So these would be ready for reacquisition, say, you see, see a Fed is up in about the night, next 18 months. But these uh, contractors have to have a top secret security clearance. Okay, now these are the support IDIQ contractors, really. <laughs> uh, 
And uh, like I said, these will be, uh, we're going to be issuing a fair biz ops for reacquisition of this any, any day now, as soon as we can get the, uh, the announcement system uh, up and running and our people, uh, the passwords they require. Uh, con current construction contractors, uh, this is only, uh, what, the five contractors that have the, the, probably what could be called the largest construction projects in support of OBO. Uh, of course, uh, you know B.O. Harbert, and Cadell is actually here. I haven't seen B.O. Harbert uh, at this facility this year. Uh, but there's Pernex AICI, uh, who is here as well. I was just speaking in front to uh, a representative from that firm. And uh, also, Framico is doing some work for us as well. Uh, pardon me? Oh, these are for uh, the, these contractors are providing uh, construction of individual projects. So we award them uh, individual design build projects for individual construction of a facility. Uh, these are current IDIQ contracts we have for uh, design, build, and construction, uh, just general construction. Uh, these are all, well, we awarded 25 contracts uh, at the last go-round. These contracts will be expiring in, say, the next eight months. We issued a FedBiz op some time ago. We're currently going through source selection on these. Uh, we plan to award uh, 28 contracts this year, uh, well, Maybe not this year, but we were this this uh, acquisition phase. We're doing 28 contracts. There'll be um, like six con contracts awarded to women-owned, six to hub zone, six to eight a, uh, six to regular small business, uh, six to women-owned hub zone, and uh, also we're including some for Alaskan Native corporations this year. Four for Latinx. Alaskan Native corporations this year. And these contracts, uh, the, the ones you see here, uh, handled all work for, uh, in support of OBO and other State Department uh, uh, activities. Uh, contracts less than $10 million, uh, and that would, we keep them very busy. We originally awarded uh, 25 contracts on this previous uh, session. And uh, we still have 20 of those contract active. We only lost one due to poor performance. The other four were lost because of uh, business. They were not a business. So they were no longer available to support us. But certainly the other 20 that are active are performing well. They're doing uh, the job that they need to do. And we look forward, hopefully, if they resubmit it, they'll get another contract. But uh, when we award these, we got probably 90 something uh, responses. That's why it's taking us so long to get through the evaluation process. Once we get the evaluation done, we'll pick the top six highest qualified contractors in each category and we'll issue the price RFP to them and then we'll make final selection. But once again, there'll be 28 of those. And uh, we started this acquisition probably about 18 months ago, I think and we probably won't get to award for another six or seven months. So as soon as we get these awarded, we'll take a break for a couple of years and then we'll start on the next acquisition because it just takes that long. So keep an eye out on the Fed business is what I'm saying, or the SAM.gov. Uh, IDI uh, opportunities, like I said, we have about 120 different IDIQ contracts awarded. Um, and this is just uh, a listing of some of them. Is in no way all of them, but you can see um, the uh, worldwide. When each one of these be renewed, the worldwide AE design services uh, for rehabilitation and renovation and new construction was just awarded in 2019. So it'll be a couple of years before we actually re uh, advertise those for acquisition. AE services, like I said, 2019. You should see that announcement go out. And you can read through there and see when the, uh, the contracts expire and then when we should be starting our uh, reacquisition. Um, and you can always send me an email as well. We have the listing, uh, a full listing of all of the IDIQ contracts that we have. Uh, and if you send me an email, then I will certainly respond with the list of IEIQ contracts and recently awarded individual um, construction project contracts. And you can talk to any of those contractors 
and try to get on their team, or you can look at the IDIQ contract list and see the expiration date and when we should start the acquisition of the follow-on contracts. And my email address is <laughs> Vivian, V-I-V-I-A-N, D for David, W for Wesley, at state.gov. Usually that's when I spell Jennifer's name, but this time I gave mine. <laughs> okay, and if you're willing to, or interested in contact the State Department or looking at some of the um, information available, uh, these are some of the sites that OBO is running for their project team. And also, if you're interested in uh, doing a capabilities uh, presentation with OBO, uh, that email address at the bottom is the uh, OBO External Affairs Office and they are always willing and available to uh, discuss uh, and set up a capability briefing for the OBO team. Okay, thank you very much. All right, this is good. You're right on schedule. You guys rehearsed well. We have 15 minutes for questions. Um, and I have to admit one thing. This is my first OBO State Department session, so I actually learned a great deal. I, I did not know why the Kennedy Center looks the way it does. Really appreciate that. And, and I also appreciate that the State Department struggles with standard design just as much as the Corps of Engineers does. So I, I really appreciate that. And then, um, yeah, Viv. I mean, that last slide, that was like the money slide. I look, let's look at that thing. That, that's what everybody's in the room for, is right that one. So I'm sure there'll be some questions there. So start putting together your questions. Again, the ground rules are, got helpers in the back. They're going to be Roman. State your name, stand up, firm, question. So formulate those questions, because I, I have a question. Because guess what? I'm the moderator. I get to ask questions, too. So really to either one of you, but Viv, it might be more to you than Stephanie. Is any firm that wants to do any of this work here on that slide most likely needs to possess either a secret or a TS facility clearance, I would assume. And so how does, it uh, should be on. So can a firm pursue any of these contracts if they do not possess a facility clearance? Yes. Uh, once a contractor is, uh, we require contractors to sometimes qualify for projects before we actually issue the RFP. Uh, we, have a, uh, we have to abide by the Omnibus Diplomatic Security Act, which requires that uh, projects, for any, uh, projects for any work that requires a security clearance related to construction or design of diplomatic facilities requires a contract to be a U.S. person. And there's six or seven different tests in that uh, definition within that, uh, the, the, that Diplomatic Security Act. And uh, anytime we perform the necessary um, qualification, we require that the contractor, of course, have a security clearance. But um, the contractors that qualify and do not have a security, security clearance are sponsored by the U.S. Department of State and given 120 days to actually obtain the security clearance. That's generally enough time, especially if the firm doesn't have any kind of uh, foreign ownership involved. Uh, but once again, when, if a contractor is sponsored by the Department of State, we, and they want to be involved in future projects, even if you don't get the, con uh, the clearance within 120 days of that original sponsorship, we'll leave the contract in the process with uh, uh, DOD to get the clearance because the contractor has expressed an interest to uh, continue working for the State Department, even if they don't get that, uh, that single project that they were interested in originally. Okay, excellent. So first question from the crowd. Courtney Paul, all the way up front. He didn't wave his hand. I can, I can, I can get there first. No, okay, wait. Come on, on the way. Almost ready. There we go. So Courtney Paul, CW Paul International. Uh, I just want to follow on to your question because uh, what I'm interested in is there's a lot of, the State Department has a lot of restrictions when it comes to how we can do instruction overseas. And you talked about the clearance. I'm also interested, what kind of restrictions do you have on local labor, using local labor forces and locally sourced materials and those sort of things because they do have a big impact on that. So if you could talk about that, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Well, for the, um, Local labor, uh, we expect contractors to use a lot of local labor in order to get the price right. Because if it shipped all labor force from the United States overseas, <laughs> the price would be prohibitive for, for, uh, for us to do more contracts. Um, so we expect them to use local labor, but certainly within the consulate and embassy, there is a uh, particular section where only U.S. personnel can do the fit out. I mean, the, the local contractor can do all of the uh, concrete work, but when it comes 
comes down to fit out the uh, classified areas, then you have to have U.S. clear labor do all of that work. And in some cases, you could, a smaller uh, project, you may be able to use some local labor under uh, surveillance. We hire particular individuals to go over and surveil the, the, the local labor while they're doing the work in these particular areas. But uh, some, some areas, you just can't uh, work in unless you have a clearance. And then a local materials, um, any materials that meet the specifications can be used. Um, some of the more experienced contractors tend to uh, buy a lot of materials within the United States and ship them overseas. That way they don't have to worry about uh, trying to uh, show the equivalency uh, and you know, any price adjustments that would follow. But um, certainly uh, average project has thousands of containers, containers that are shipped from the United States overseas to carry them. Excellent. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Tyson Bogum. I'm with CAM Services. We provide uh, construction management, especially for new um, companies that want to get into the OBO world. So I've been in the field for the last eight years, project engineer, quality control manager, project manager, and I just wanted to talk a little bit more about the materials and substitution. Uh, that was always a really difficult thing to do because, like you said, all the specs are ASTM. Um, and so my question is, uh, with the new design firms coming out, is there going to be any emphasis on creating comparative standards, like EU will also be uh, able to substitute quite easily for ASTM, which ones will, which ones won't? Because EU, it's uh, on the contractor side, nearly impossible to try to convince that it is the same standard as ASTM, because it's a completely different world, completely different test requirements. and. Um, just for cost uh, savings for everybody, being able to use local material would be a win-win across the board. It just seems we're hitting, uh, we're just tripping ourselves with holding ourselves to only American products, and it just seems like an easy fix that can be done up front. And uh, I would say that really is uh, project-dependent, uh, what we can entertain, um, not just the substitution request, but sort of uh, formatively based with the design Thank you. My name is Anthony Josie, and I'm uh, a senior procurement uh, analyst in a small business office with State Department. A couple of years ago, Dave and I talked about increasing the number of uh, small businesses on those IDIQs, and just from that slide, I think that's an increase of two to three new small businesses on each one of those. If you look at those five uh, federal socioeconomic categories, um, so we're talking about an increase of maybe 10 to 12 new small businesses on those, um, as well as the tribal and 
ANC um, component that wasn't there. So our office thanks you. I didn't know that until just now. So that's a big win uh, for small businesses. <laughs> Um, so I wanted to just mention that. The other thing is, um, you didn't, uh, the slide didn't address those one-off opportunities. Can you talk about that, that pop-up in uh, FBO, such as the uh, uh, big project over at uh, FSI um, that oh, just came up? So, so just because some of those may not be recompeted, we always have other one-off opportunities, and I want you to hit on that. Yeah, like I was saying, in general, the IPIP contract handles uh, projects in less than 15 billion. And anything from 15 billion up to about 35, 40 million is always set aside for small businesses as well. It's just an individual uh, FSI announcements for those single projects. And of course, we're looking for any qualified small business to respond to those. We usually don't do market research even for the ones up to 40 million because we know we have the small business contingent that can do that work. It's just a matter of getting them to actually. And uh, it, my office has always done the support for OBOs, and of course for all of the OBOs. Those projects are overseas, uh, but this time, uh, and GSA handles all the Department of State work within the United States, except at our uh, uh, Foreign Service Institute in uh, Roslyn, uh, in uh, Arlington, Virginia. Uh, that one, the GSA led us through our own construction, and we have two projects coming up at that facility. Uh, one is a Thousand square foot facility. Uh, I'd give you a dollar amount for the uh, estimate, but sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> but it, it is a larger one. I think the far out we can say it's above uh, 10 million, so it's even above 15 million. So it, it's a larger project. Uh, and then there's another one that's going to be a separate project, and that one is a perimeter wall security upgrade at that same facility in Arlington. That'll be a smaller project for one as well, but of course, that one I don't see any problem with setting that one aside for small business. But we did do market research for the larger project, and we didn't get any responses from uh, qualified small business. But uh, we look forward to getting them at least uh, on the uh, prime contract or subcontract. Uh, well, one last question. We got a break. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon. My name is Mia Parton. I'm with the Parmi Engineering, um, civil engineering firm. Um, we specialize in utilities. And my question is out of curiosity. I'm not sure how it works overseas. But uh, the facilities that we have, I guess the um, data communications and telecommunications, um, when you're all over the world and the local um, countries and local uh, networks are not as advanced. Um, how do you handle making sure that you have your 5G, uh, fast, high speed broadband um, technologies and access for our diplomats and facilities? Thank you.
All right. Well, excellent. You guys have been a great audience. You've asked questions. Please give them a round of applause. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and you'll be mobbed here. So thank you all again. I also want to thank both of you from the State Department for supporting this conference, supporting this society, and for your service to our nation. Thank you.